Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to um, introduce myself. My name is Carl Collins. I'm a digital engineering consultant to SIBSI. Um, I'll be chairing this, and um, with me is Andrew Krebs from Hawley, who is the person who wrote the Digital Engineering Guide 6.1. Um, which I hope everybody's read and is enjoying. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so um, over the past few months, we've been busy writing our cybersecurity and building services design guide, and this is intended unsurprisingly, for building services engineers at consulting, contracting and operations and maintenance level to think about what are the uh, aspects that we should be looking at when designing systems in terms of cyber security. Okay, so there's a picture of me and a picture of Andy, so you know what we look like. <laughs> Um, we've been working on our digital engineering series for a couple of years now, and what we're trying to do with this is to cover the main topics around building information modeling, BIM, and uh, digital engineering more generally. Uh, we see BIM as being one aspect of digital engineering. It's mainly dealing with the exchange of information, but there's an awful lot to deal with with the generation of information and the potential usages. And one of the important things in terms of security are what are the unintended usages of the information that we're generating and sharing more widely. And that's been the driver behind creating this uh, digital engineering 6.1 series publication. There was a quote that we came across, um, which is mildly humorous, I think. Um, in a relatively short time, we've taken a system built to resist new destruction by nuclear weapons and made it vulnerable to toasters. And that was by a guy called Jeff Jarmok. And he's talking about the internet there. But I think when we look at what the internet is used for now, especially in terms of Internet of Things devices and the sharing of data, the sharing of our designs and our operations and maintenance, it's quite interesting because you know we do have now um, Internet of Things accessibility built into so many of the devices that we have, that we carry around with us, and these things connect up to all sorts of other devices. So while it is a, a slightly flippant, uh, statement to make. It is a, quite an interesting way of looking at what we're actually doing with uh, the information that we create and how it's shared and whether we want it to be shared. Some time ago, um, at British Standards, um, they created a uh, PAS called PAS 1192 Part 5. The 1192 series of publicly available specifications and standards is the set that defines what building information modelling is in the UK and is the definition in part or in whole of what the BIM Level 2 procedure is supposed to be. This is intended uh, to be a specification for security-minded building information modeling. So we're thinking about what is it that we have to do to secure the information that we create, to secure the sharing of it, but also it takes a slightly wider look as well at how does the physicality of our constructed spaces interact with the security aspects and what should we be thinking of during this time. So as a response to this, and for building service engineers more specifically, we dissected an awful lot of the information and we created our digital engineering series number six, which was uh, a response to the PADS. But we're looking at it more deeply. We said, actually, there's a whole design process and a way of looking at this information that we really need to share with our membership. So that's where DE 6.1 came into being. What we were looking at with the 6.1 um, to differentiate from the topics of PAS 1182.5 covered was to try to really bring it into the building services um, context. So looking at how elements of what's covered in PAS 1182.5 relates directly to the work that we do as building services engineers. Cybersecurity sort of was this, the standout feature um, of the how um, security risks and threats could um, be addressed within the context of building services. So we decided to take it 
um, and focus it purely on cyber security um, and to try to start this conversation um, if nothing else of how a design process can aid a solid cyber security strategy or how it could also hamper it there was a report recently uh, from Symantec, um, which you can download for free. It's actually uh, read, makes quite interesting reading, um, looking at all of the potential threats and the threat levels that are posed by cybersecurity. Um, <clears throat> it's got a whole series of facts and figures about the various types of threat that uh, internet-enabled devices in particular look uh, are, are vulnerable to. So things like messaging, malware, um, mobile devices and web attacks, targeted attacks, specifically Internet of Things and the underground economy. Um, if you fancy a quick 61-page read, um, I'm sure we can share the link to this um, as a part of the uh, deliverables at the end of this webinar. Um, it does make interesting reading. Um, not too scary, I don't think. It's just all of the things that we should be aware of in our general working and home life. One of the things that they talked about um, in the report was the increased attacks against industrial control systems. Um, the THRIP group went after satellites and Triton attacked industrial safety systems, leaving them vulnerable to sabotage or extortion attacks. Any computing device is a potential target. Now, certainly when I started in building services engineering, computing devices and building services products were completely different things. These days, they're less so. You often find all, all kinds of internet connectivity in industrial controls, in building services controls, in BMS systems. Even light fittings now have Bluetooth connectivity. So all of the stuff that we're providing in the built environment has some level of risk associated with it in terms of cyber vulnerabilities. Okay, thanks Carl for that introduction. Um, the next part of this webinar I'm going to go through the concept of the document and some details within it and um, towards the end give a little bit of a demonstration as to how parts of the document can be used. The first thing we had to do when we were trying to put something down on cyber security is understand that while cyber security is in and of itself a separate topic, these things aren't silos. And in the course of the document, as I'm sure those who have um, had a chance to digest it have noticed, it's very difficult to simply talk about cyber security in and of itself. And this discussion today is going to reflect that cyber security and physical security are internally linked um, and elements that we are talking about today will sort of jump between the two um, as is relevant. The case has to be examined prior to a decision being made how cyber security is going to be addressed in any project. Um, projects are all different, the assets are different, the risks are different, there may be um, very similar looking projects with entirely different approaches required, there may be almost no approach required in some and there may be a very serious approach required um, on others. The risks and hazards specific to any built asset need to be understood at the earliest stage and an assessment has to be made as to how the project the design project, then the construction and so on, should respond to the assessment of those risks and hazards. The results of this assessment are themselves sensitive and sharing of this information could, should only be done with the necessary parties. So it may be the case that a risk assessment comes to pass, but you might not want to share that with the rest of the design team, uh, with certain elements of the design team or the supply chain. So that needs to be understood as well. Any parties for whom sharing this information is not appropriate should be made subject to carefully worded scopes of services within the project to help them understand how they should be acting, but not necessarily why. One of the overriding elements of assessing and acting on security issues, no matter what the context, is competence. It's the same across all engineering, really. Um, to undertake any task, you have to be competent, otherwise you're at great risk of causing more harm than good. 
as engineers, when we are doing our engineering degrees or building services degrees, even architecture degrees, we don't really get taught the ins and outs of information and cyber security. And as a result, we've all got a good idea of how it affects us in our daily lives, but we've got less of an idea as to the specifics of how to do it professionally in a project. Therefore, if any doubt exists whilst you're doing the assessment phase, it's really prudent to um, engage the services of an expert. Um, there are plenty good, capable security advisors out there who are willing to work for a fee, obviously, um, but who can bring an awful lot of value to a project, especially in a situation where the client has some risks that they're trying to mitigate. This document is demonstrably not a substitute for an expert. Carol's already mentioned PAS 1192.5, um, and I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but there's one element of that which is probably the most useful of all in this context, which is the um, security triage process. This is a very simple um, set of steps, which you can see laid out in front of you, um, but can be accessed in slightly higher resolution in the PAS itself, which is a way to achieve a balanced look at how a project security requirements um, can be best dealt with. We would hesitate to suggest any other method, um, which is why we've included it in this document. I think it's a very good place to start, but it may then create further discussion as to other areas that you want to look in in detail. Um, but that's entirely dependent upon the nature of the project. One of the first areas that we looked at um, in the document was understanding with the client the appetite to which they want to mitigate certain risks. Risk appetite um, is defined in DE 6.1 as the amount of known risk a client is willing to accept in order to create desired benefits. And what that really means is understanding the extent to which a client is willing to suffer um, inconvenience to mitigate a risk. That's another way of putting it. There's no point making something so secure that it renders a part of the asset unusable if the risk associated with it is very low. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that there may not be a uniform risk appetite across the entire asset or the entire building. Some areas of a building may have a higher acceptability um, of hazards than, than others. Some areas may be public access and therefore the, the risk associated with them may be different to that with the sensitive information being handled or used on a regular basis. So it's the, the key to this is really understanding what it is a client is trying to achieve in the different parts of the building or the built assets. And then we can start to understand how we should act in those areas. We've attempted to indicate how the usefulness of an asset, the usefulness of a system or a function changes depending on how secure it is and how the security is responding to different um, factors. There are two graphs within the document, um, both of which are shown here. The one on this slide indicates the principle that without an adequate level of security, the value of many items, many systems, many buildings even, does not exceed the cost. So there's no point having an all singing, all dancing building if it's so insecure that you're never able to actually get the benefit of it because it's far too easy for people to override it, break stuff, um, make life difficult for the occupants for whatever reason. Therefore, it's not a viable option to completely and utterly skimp on security because you want to have the, the latest technology or the latest bells and whistles in an asset or on, on a particular system. You've got to understand that they only work whilst you've got control of them. Um, an awful lot of our clients probably won't have to worry too much about an awful lot of these things, but without understanding the nature of that, it's difficult to say for sure. The second graph almost argues against what I've just said, um, it, and it suggests that if a system is so secure that it ceases to be functional, there's absolutely no point having it. So the two graphs together do suggest a balance has to be struck between functionality and um, security. There's no point in wrapping up something so tightly it can't move. Um, rather timely today, as I was surfing LinkedIn and the train into um, this webinar, I discovered an article by the National Cyber Security Centre which talks about this exact topic in particularly good terms. 
the National Cybersecurity Centre released an awful lot of articles discussing cybersecurity specifically, but when you read them, you understand how they directly relate to what we are doing with building services engineers. And I think we need to also realise that if we wrap something up too tightly, people, the users, will find a way to override the security of that system, and therefore it becomes completely insecure despite all the time, effort, and money we spent trying to secure it. So as, as with all things, balance is needed. Understanding the design, understanding the MEP design, and understanding how the design operates across a building is a really important way of starting to get a feel for anything that might, any sort of hidden security considerations that we may not notice straight away. If your client does a particularly sensitive job and their asset is designed to facilitate that, then there are some obvious risks that you would choose to um, mitigate, but it's only when you start to look at how the building itself functions do we start to understand where some of these vulnerabilities might be exploited by people who wish to do the client harm. So, for example, um, if we were to take a liquid fuel distribution system in a distribution warehouse um, and disrupt it, say for a large supermarket chain or something, and if you happen to be working for another large supermarket chain, if you could prevent them from fueling all their trucks, they'd be unable to um, distribute their goods and therefore the shops would not be able to function. It's a very abstract concept, but it doesn't take an awful lot of thinking to see how um, disrupting building services systems can have a profound effect on quite a large public facing organisation. So we're going to talk through some examples um, later on as uh, an example later on um, as to how to start to measure those risks. Um, but once we've done this, um, basic analysis and this basic understanding of the systems within the building. We might now be at a point where some very simple solutions present themselves to us. Um, we might now be able to understand that some systems don't need to be connected to a wider network, um, that they can be hand, the function can be done internally. There's a great fashion at the moment to connect everything to the internet and to be able to alter the ventilation um, within a building from 3,000 miles away whilst you're on your holiday on a beach. But you've got to bear in mind that if you can do it over your phone, there's a very good chance someone else can. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, are these things relevant to the building or the asset that I'm designing? And are these nice to have, but necessarily maybe they might take us over the threshold of risk that we or a client would be willing to accept? Another really good example is Bluetooth Lumineers. Um, they have an awful lot of great functionality for a variety of situations, but Bluetooth is nothing if not hackable by somebody who really wants to get into it. So we've got to understand, are we in a scenario where having our light fittings hackable by somebody passing by in a van? Is that going to be a problem? Is it likely ever to come to pass? Um, and if so, do we want to do something about it? And another obvious solution is, is this stuff publicly accessible? Is the main um, gas or electric intake into a building just out in a street that anyone can block it, cut it, do anything to it? Do we need to start thinking about relocating those to secure sites for particular buildings? So these are very, very basic things. And to be fair, I suspect we probably think about them in the day-to-day -day design work that we do um, purely from a practical perspective. Is it worth having the main electrical in common one say a building or another? But hopefully what this document will do will start to make us also consider how accessing those systems will have an impact on the building itself. And you can start to see now how cyber security and physical security are very difficult to differentiate in this scenario. One of the tools provided with DE 6.1 is a rather large cause and effect matrix, which asks us um, to rather laboriously go through each system and understand how one system may operate fine and not be vulnerable in its sort of fully working state. But when other systems around it start to fail, then we may have a cascade of failure, which could cause problems for um, the client, the building, people within the building, people around the building, that may not be necessarily um, obvious when we're doing the design work. What this will allow us to do as well is it will allow us to understand where some failures may actually have no significant problem and we don't need to 
work too hard um, on them and possibly concentrate our efforts elsewhere. So as with all good scenarios, we've got ourselves a mathematical formula. Now, even by my standards of mathematics, this one's not too complicated. We have, in essence, three variables, um, A, B, and C, but C is in two parts. If we're examining a system um, and how its failure will affect another system, firstly, we need to look at A, which is the measure of what sort of failure it will take on the what we call the nominated system. So the system we're first looking at, how badly it's got to fail before the subsequent system will start to fail. Okay, um, we're going to use a bit of a fictional example. We'll use the same one, which is in um, the, the document itself, which is a warehouse in a rural location which contains um, agricultural chemicals as well as a small office space um, and some other storage of bits and bobs. It's a fairly generic example as you can see, um, but it allows us to bring a little bit of context to this. The systems we're looking at here are the water distribution and supply system, which is our nominated system, so that's the first one we're looking at, and the fire extinguishing system, which is the subsequent system. And hopefully you can um, immediately see that fire extinguishing systems and water distribution systems have a relationship with each other. So A is a type of failure which we're examining on the nominated system, which is the um, water distribution system in this case. We choose a value based on the level of failure required to affect the fire extinguishing system. The scenario here um, suggests that the building is isolated from other buildings and there's a small number of staff members in site, but they're qualified technicians so that they're working in a in a store environment, they're qualified to operate that store environment, so they have a, a reasonable level of technical ability to operate the building that they're in, and water distribution is part of that. They're responsible for maintaining the operation of the building, so understanding who's going to be in the building and understanding how they can interact with the systems is really key here because it really makes a difference to understanding how the risks can be mitigated quite easily on site if something does break. So we have the water distribution supply system here, which will require a long-term failure, which cannot be fixed on site to start to have a effect on the fire extinguishing system on the basis that there's a large water tank on site. So the extinguishing system will be able to operate for a period of time before it starts to notice the failure of the water system itself. So as a result of that, we put number six, which is long-term failure requiring external staff to restore operation. Um, into a, our little formula here, and then we move on to step two. What step two gives us is an understanding of the affected system, the fire extinguishing system. We need to understand what will happen if the failure that we've already forecast comes to pass. So obviously, a fire extinguishing system may have multiple components, but one of them is generally and often is the spraying of water into an area where there's fire, provided there are no chemicals. So that's another important scenario for this building. We're probably not going to be spraying chemicals, uh, a chemical fire with water that's generally frowned upon and is not a good idea. But the internal domestic spaces, the office parts of this building have, um, may have sprinklers and may require water to um, be operating in one way or another for uh, fire retardation. So if you've got no water, you don't have any sprinklers. So therefore that area is going to have long-term failure, but once the water is back on board, the internal staff should be able to fix it, so it doesn't require external staff to restore the operation. So for that, we're going to use the value number five and pop it into the formula, as you can see before you. The next bit is the sort of the, the catastrophic bit, for want of a better way to put it, is understanding what damage all this is going to do. So we've understood what sort of failure is required to take place before a subsequent failure comes to pass. And now we're going to have to understand the harm it has on the asset um, and those within the asset. This is split into two digits. As you can see, there's significantly more um, options to this. And the, the options come in two parts. Um, the, the first part is a letter, which is A, B, or C. Uh, which can simply be broken down into A being no harm at all, B being minor harm to 
some something and C being major harm to something. And then the second digit, which is a number, starts to define um, what it is which is being harmed. So we have internal occupants, we have external entities, be they people or other assets, um, and we have the building op um, operation and a combination of all three of these. So as you can see, the, the list starts to grow. And as a result of um, the water failure only affecting the domestic areas, and there being a, a water tank which allows the sprinklers to operate even if the water supply has failed, then we can forecast that failure in the water is only going to cause the potential for minor harm to the building operation and internal occupants, because the sprinklers should run for a reasonable level of time to allow people to get out um, prior to that. And in the chemical store areas, the chances of us using water to put the fire out are quite slim anyway. So there will either be another system in place or there will have been other mitigating factors um, to prevent the spread of fire and to prevent the lack of water being a problem. So we have given ourselves here B4 as the classification. And that, in effect, gives us the result. Now, what you'll see here is something which doesn't necessarily, if you're to look at it in isolation, mean very much. Um, and this is the important part of how we use this information. We've now got a full description of the cause and effect of the failure of one system and another. And we can do this now for all the relevant systems and start to understand how failure in one system will cascade through the building to other systems and then associated harm, which will be caused. But we need to understand that the grading system should not be looked at as high is bad and low is good. For example, the higher the first number, the less likely the specific harm is to come to pass. Um, it requires a greater failure on the nominated system to happen. So a large number here is not as scary as a large number in the second part, for example. And often when we're dealing with risk assessments, the higher the number, the more concerned people get. It's not the case here. We need to understand the context. It should be noted that the factors governing the levels of risk in each instance are complex and often consideration must be given beyond the immediately obvious factors. Therefore, a deep understanding of how systems work and how they affect the local environment is vital. Failure to address the cause and effect adequately will lead to a situation where there's an assumption of safety where the opposite is actually true. So if we only look at the sort of a, a very basic level of operation and a basic understanding of how the systems interact, we may not actually discover any perceived risks at all. But if we don't understand those systems, we're, not, we're wasting our time in essence. It's more dangerous to think you're in a safe situation when you're not than to be able to admit to yourself that you actually don't understand enough and to go and seek expert help. So it's a really important um, understanding here is that we don't give this to the nearest work placement student um, sat at the desk twiddling their thumbs, that senior design engineers need to be doing this cause and effect analysis um, and making sure that it has the, sort of the full credence of the MEP design without it um, we're wasting our time and probably causing more harm than good. That sort of covers the main messages that we're trying to get through in, D in DE 6.1. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of the, the first edition of the document, and it's a very specific subject, cybersecurity for building services design. Cybersecurity doesn't only apply to the IT systems, but in this context, it applies to all the systems. If you look at it from a remotely controlled um, viewpoint. What we really want to be taken away from those who read the document and those who do this on projects is understanding that assets can be threatened through any system with the right access. So it might not be obvious, but it can be done if people are able to gain access to it. The second and equally as important, if not more important point, is that your competence is key to this. The competence of the person doing the work and doing the assessment um, and working with the clients is absolutely vital. And if you're not sure that you or your organization has that competence, employ an expert to do this. Um, the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure are very good at providing sort of high level um, advice and uh, I um, suggest you avail yourself of that. Most risks can be mitigated by simple good design decisions. Um, as we sort of discovered earlier, an awful lot of the big stuff can be easily engineered out and often is easily engineered out by accident without real understanding that's what we're doing just through the design work that we carry out. One of those solutions, don't connect hackable systems 
where there was no benefit from doing so. Don't put stuff onto the internet that doesn't need to be there, and then it's much, much harder to hack. Um, and the, the last one, which is what we just covered with the formula, understand the consequences of system failure across a whole asset. It's not just about what will happen if you lose one system, it's about how that system affects others. From that, that really comes to the end of my, my explanation of the document.